Well, welcome back for the final three sessions. Journalists have been among the first and most passionate advocates of social media, as we've heard reference to in many of the sessions earlier today. And our next session is focused on that. It's a double header between two people at the bleeding edge of that relationship, The Guardian's Joanna Geary and Twitter's Bruce Daisley. Bruce is the Twitter's UK director, and he describes himself on his own Twitter page as a bionic sales director. He says he gets excited about work, culture, laughing, and most frequently, pop music. And in a survey earlier this year, he was named the fantasy hire that most leaders would like to make. His co-presenter, Joanna, says that if content is king, then collaboration is queen. And she is responsible for setting strategies at the Guardian's team of coordinators and moderators, as well as developing new tools so that her journalists can better understand and reach their readers. And we're very lucky that today Joanna is going to be revealing a world first, a first which is a major product launch that's happening today by chance and is targeted at improving social conversations with readers. And it is being kept under wraps, top secret uh, until today. So it's going to be very interesting to, to hear what that is. And Bruce and Joanna have also agreed to take questions which they will moderate themselves. So without further ado, can I please introduce Bruce and Joanna on the collaboration between big media and little media. Morning. Um, hi, everyone. So uh, really what I'm going to talk about today is, is how Twitter, I think we've heard it a lot this morning, how Twitter is engaging with the, the news consumption process and the news uh, discovery process, how it's bringing those things to the top. Uh, I'm going to start with this, this report here. Um, it is uh, just a great piece of work that a journalist called Nadia Hahn put out about a month ago. And she's an Austrian journalist who really took from the, the perspective of trying to understand how journalists can use Twitter. The fascinating thing, Nadia Hahn uh, published this really from the perspective that she was working at a news organisation that didn't permit journalists to use Twitter. So a lot of the stuff I talk about came from this perspective, her deciding to use it. In fact, I'll tweet out the link to it afterwards, but fascinatingly, her uh, Twitter stream today is filled with reportage of the fact that even though she's an Austrian journalist, she was at the Boston Marathon yesterday. So uh, her husband was at the line when, uh, when the bomb went off. So uh, I think everyone's fine, but just a good illustration, really, of how people can actually be on the news uh, broadcasting side and the news gathering side and so, so that report uh, is called what good is twitter i'll start by kicking off just giving our perspective of twitter twitter's a strange thing isn't it but rory sutherland says you couldn't backwards engineer it none of it if you play it backwards makes any sense so it starts uh, 140 characters is entirely related to 160 characters on a text message and in fact it, the, the whole system started as something that you could text an update of what you're doing from your phone but here's the way that we think about Twitter. We think about Twitter being the shortest distance between you and what interests you most. And I guess the, the important point of difference there is that a lot of newspapers still refer to Twitter as a micro-blogging service. But probably, as you heard today, the default setting on Twitter is consumption. So it's a news service. It's, a, it's effectively it's a personalised news feed. Our founder, a guy called Jack Dorsey, who has also founded another business called Square, a sort of serial entrepreneur, uh, he, he calls Twitter the world in your pocket, your, your ability to check what's up at a moment's <coughs> notice. So uh, shortest distance between you and what interests you most, and just to try, try and evolve that a bit, you is represented by the at sign, and what interests you most is represented by the hashtag. One of the, one of the sort of most esoteric parts of Twitter is the hashtag. I think the best description I saw of it was that Twitter's a chat room, so these, these 400 million tweets every day, a vast volume of conversation on things, and hashtags are the channels. So hashtags are the things that just hold a conversation together. And I'll, I'll illustrate it, uh, later on how that works. So here's, here's the way that Twitter really operates in, in uh, synergy with the, the news world. It both helps on gathering and distributing news. So to just look at how Twitter helps gather news firstly. And just to, uh, to, to take a quotation from Nadia's report. There's no question if you're not on Facebook and Twitter, you're not getting the full story. And that's from a, a BBC chief international correspondent. An illustration really that journalists are using it as a way to, to gather distributed news uh, perspectives from a wider audience. Here's one example of that. We're all clearly familiar that George Osborne's the worst chancellor of our lifetime. 
so lucky to be living through this era. But here's one tweet uh, from someone who uh, was, was fortunate enough to be on a train when George Osborne decided to try and sneak into first class with a second class. We've all tried to do it. Not all of us for the Chancellor Exchequer. So you can see this, uh, a journalist here was fortunate enough to be on the spot when this happened. And just a good illustration, really, in terms of gathering, what immediately has happened is that all of us now have got high-definition camera in our pockets and the ability to broadcast that. So probably one of the most fascinating things is just observing something like the helicopter crash three months ago in London. The first reportage that came from that was, was noise, was conversational, was, was people tweeting that they'd seen the crash. About three or four minutes after it happened, the, the first photograph was posted. And in fact, that guy, it was his first ever tweet, the guy who uh, posted that. He joined Twitter, he used it for news, but it was the first time he'd ever posted a tweet. He went into a four-hour meeting, he came out, his photograph was on the front page of the Evening Standard. So just a good illustration um, of, of how these things are overlapping. But, but what we're now empowered to do is we, we all have the ability to effectively contribute to news, and, and Joanna's going to talk more about that in a second. Another quotation from the report. Social media allows me to get much closer to the story. By the time it appears on the wire, I will have already spotted it through social media. And in fact, we, we've heard this previously from the, the previous presentation. The ability now to connect. That's not to replace PA, in fact. If you look at the death of, of Margaret Thatcher last week, all of the sources uh, started at 12.48. And principally, the first people to tweet it out were the journalists who were sitting closest to the PA uh, reporting wire. So uh, clearly... PA still remains a still a trusted source. And I think that's the, the important thing that we'd, we'd emphasise. Because while when we ask journalists, this is Nadia's report again, when you ask journalists how important is Twitter for research, a lot of them will say it's very important. There's still a, a group who say it's not that important. But a lot of them will say it's important. However, what Twitter doesn't do, it doesn't do the investigation. So if you look at the most recent press awards, this was the scoop of the year. This is something that Twitter couldn't do. Twitter can capture conversation. Twitter can capture the moment. It can spectate on things. But what it can't do is it can't do the analysis uh, that classic journalism does. So, so this report by Times Journalists won the scoop of the year, the, the best reporting for the year, and effectively is the sort of deep analysis that social media could never provide. In fact, if you go back to the helicopter crash, to different, differentiate the way that people might have consumed the news, or even the, the Boston uh, bomb yesterday... What Twitter's very good at is drawing attention to things. It, it's uh, people immediately alerting you to something big's happened. However, the analysis of that, the understanding, the, the real insight into why it's happened is something that social media alone couldn't do. Which sort of brings us on to the distribution of news. So I've looked at how Twitter can help gathering, just looking at the distribution of news. First thing uh, that the report documents is that there's been a 5,000% increase over the last two years in the amount of referral traffic from social media. So we heard earlier that this isn't just the, the, the big names that you heard of, but it's also sites like Reddit or StumbleUpon that you've, uh, you heard mention of this morning. Effectively, the, the net of, reaching, uh, of stories reaching you is far far broader. Someone in our office said uh, about their consumption of news, they said, if a story's big enough, it will find me. And I think that the, it's an interesting take on the, the world of news reporting. The notion that you need to check in on the news now, for some younger audiences, has been replaced by the idea that stories will reach me if they're big enough. Just so back to the, the final slide from Nadia's work, really, just looking how important is Twitter for journalists for promoting their work? And it, notice here that no one says it's not important. Effectively, journalists see that the ability to break down stories into single atoms and to allow them to distribute and to flow where people's interests are is really powerful. So we talk about Twitter being an interest network rather than a social network. You follow the things that you're, uh, you're supremely interested in. And that might be your sports team, or it might be the fact that you're interested in technology. But the ability, therefore, for, for news organisations to break their stories down into those single atoms is really powerful. If you look at some key stats, the Times Fashion uh, Twitter account has 1.1 million followers. It's probably one of the biggest distribution points for fashion news in the UK. In fact, uh, clearly that audience is global. But it, the, the ability for the Times to, to establish themselves as a beacon of excellence in that area is something that previously they would have had to try and bundle into a broader collection. 
So here's what I think the compelling fact for, for Newsworks and for the, the news industries is that this report was from uh, Carnegie Mellon University. Try to understand the, that 400 million tweets every day and try to analyse it. And here's what they found. So this is their claim, and I can't verify it, but they claimed that 1% of users create 50% of all content. And if you want to try and understand the profile of those people, broadly they represent the authorities who've, who've come from the, the worlds of journalism. So classically, the people that you'll follow are the people who, whether on TV, in print, have, have established themselves as a, a name, a trusted go-to point. So that could be uh, Times Fashion, it could be Grace Dent at the end, Independent, it could be uh, a, a journalist working, an investigative journalist working at The Guardian. It could be any of those things. But I think a, a key reminder why Twitter is so important for distribution of news content. So I looked at those two things. I looked at how Twitter can help gather stories and uh, effectively by put, having people on the ground uh, a, a vast distributed network across all of the smartphones in the UK is something that clearly no newsroom on its own could have. And the distribution, I think, is vital. The ability for those atoms of news, those particles of, of news to follow where people's interests are is, is clearly one of the, the most potent ways for news organisations to take advantage. Let me hand over to uh, Joanna. Thank you. So, as Bruce has already mentioned... Um, you know, Twitter is an incredible tool both for journalists to promote their work but also to do journalism. Um, and within The Guardian, we've recognised that for quite a long time and we actually have one of the highest social media adoption rates in any newsroom in the world, we are told. Um, however, there are still some questions about social. I know it sounds silly, but how do we know it's news? At that point, as... Um, you know, we were discussing, you know, that someone tweets, it draws your attention to a big event, but do you really, as an individual, know it's news? Well, you might call me stupid for saying that because when Nick Walker was commuting to work and a helicopter fell out of the sky and crashed into the office next door to his, he kind of knew it was a big deal. You know, his first um, tweet was, as Bruce was saying, text. Um, he then uploaded a picture and then this video. He knew it was big. He didn't necessarily uh, share it online to share it with news agencies or news organisations. He shared it because it was a big event in his life. This is big news. This is what happened afterwards. So this is um, the act of journalism in the traditional sense occurring afterwards. Nick Walker had a busy day. Ian's keen. I'm still a bit suspicious about that. I don't know if that's really Associated Press. It goes on to advertise how much you can earn from working from home for about <laughs> 20 tweets afterwards. But still, you know, Nick was busy. It's a very funny, interesting sort of way of doing journalism now where we are identifying something online and we are being really, really savvy about having to get to people quickly but we sometimes forget what sort of effect that has on the individual themselves. This guy has just seen a helicopter almost kill him um, and this is the sort of response he gets in some ways amazing and he was great he actually sent that video directly to one of those journalists before he posted it out anywhere else um, but just four years ago almost to the day we didn't even know how to do that you know there was probably only about five journalists in the world that knew that when a plane crashed into the Hudson River they could go on to a social network like Twitter, find an individual that may have taken a picture of it and then understand how to get in contact with them and how to <coughs> reuse that online. So we've come a long way. But it's only really part of the story. One other part of the story is whether it's ever news in the first place or whether it's not the news you think it is. I don't know if any of you have seen this before, but this is a purportedly golden eagle attacking a baby which went viral a couple of months ago and was picked up by some news organisations and run as a story until it was realised it was actually developed by a class of students learning how to make online video hoaxes. <laughs> That's an A star there, right? So it was a story. It was a very, very good online video hoax story about an excellent video. It was not a story about a child coming to any harm due to a golden eagle. Um, and this is where 
journalists become crucial in this age of sharing big events. They are the ones that essentially have to form that trusted relationship with you and they need to have the skills to be able to do that. So at The Guardian, we think it's very important for, the, for our journalists to be learning video and picture verification skills, <coughs> understanding how to actually take some of the data that's involved in these videos, use shadow analysis, understand the provenance of them, where they've come from, and try and make a judgment to allow, um, to be able to make a judgment on what they are seeing and whether they can share it onto you as it is or with additional context to allow you to know really what the story is. But sometimes, sometimes we don't know there's a story there at all without journalists. And this is still essential, um, social is still an essential storytelling tool in this process, but it works in a different way. This is not about the individual at the time knowing that anything they know is news. Sorry. This is about us having a hunch or us having done some research and social being a way for us to bring that out. So, people stocking shelves at Poundland. Unlikely, we're going to get a tweet followed by a picture, followed by a YouTube video by someone starting on their first day stocking shelves at Poundland unless they're really loving it or really hating it. However, it's news, and it was big news for us. So um, one of our reporters, Shiv Malik, was starting to understand that there may be something slightly unfair about the government's workfare scheme for graduates who are currently searching for jobs. So with the help of our community team, um, he worked up an appeal for information targeting young graduates, asking them if they had noticed anything or what their experiences were with workfare. And Kate Riley came forward. She had been doing work experience at a museum, the type of job she wanted to get into, and she had been told that she would not get any more benefits unless she stopped doing that and went to work at Poundland for free stocking shelves. <coughs> she didn't think that was very fair. Um, we started to realise that there was an issue related to that as well and ran a story. Kate was approached for, um, by a company offering legal help and she successfully challenged the workfare scheme in court. Us knowing and being able to have those conversations online can lead to big stories. It doesn't always have to start with that one big story being shared first. And finally, while well, slightly running out of time, I can talk to you on that note about our launch today. Let me introduce you to Guardian Witness. You can, if you have a phone or a connection to the internet right now, you can see it at guardian.co.uk forward slash witness. And this is about us saying that that social conversation exists right into the heart of the journalism that we do. It's a platform, but it's also a platform that's integrated into the way that we tell stories on our own site. So let me take you through it very, very quickly, knowing I haven't got any time left. Um, this is guardian.co.uk witness. On it, you would see a number of assignments, which are related to actual stories that are running on The Guardian today. Um, and these are stories that people, journalists, are working with readers in order to create something that they wouldn't have been able to do in any other way. It's integrated into our site. I hope you can see this completely. When, we were, when we're working with readers, it actually appears our request to collaborate with readers appears right inside the body of the article. And that's both on desktop and on mobile. This works across all platforms. There's a little bit of a shot of, of what the um, site looks like within uh, the witness site. What we then allow journalists to do is every single piece of content is reviewed editorially. And everything that meets editorial, the editorial assignment is posted online. It's a place for people to come and to share and to talk about the stories that they work with journalists on. But journalists then are able to take those and integrate them into their coverage. And we've done a lot of work around the production of that and integrating it into the newsroom production process. We have apps for both iPhone and Android, which are downloadable from the site and available globally. And it's our Android one. What I think is really important to say to you now is 
there is also something really unique about this in terms of the commercial proposition. Now, I'm editorial. I can speak to it a bit, but there's a man in the audience, David Pemsel, who will be able to tell you a lot more about it. Um, but it's a completely unique collaboration for The Guardian, um, one that we haven't done before. Um, EE, uh, we've worked with EE on this pro um, project. It's a new type of brand partnership. They came into it from the beginning and have worked with us across the entire project. Um, and the app and the site and the call-outs, they are powered by EE. It's something that we haven't done before, but it's something that we want to do again. Um, we think it's really significant because this is a really editorially significant project and we wouldn't have done it or been able to do it in the time um, that we've been able to do it with the partnership with EE. And I think that's really important when we talk about the power of social conversations. We can have them by collaborating together. Thank you very much. I don't know if there's any questions from the floor. Chap here. Uh, I don't know. I personally don't know anything about it. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's Jeff up there. It's Greg Grimmer. Question for Joanna. The church state divide, great sales job there for the EE job. I'm sure David has got a place for you in his department somewhere. But um, that church state divide on um, yeah. the, the new uh, site, and how, how do you see that changing, and specifically at The Guardian, which is. Yeah, a very different animal now than it was when it was a print only. I had to rehearse the commercial line because it doesn't come naturally. E understand that this is an editorial product and the assignments that are set, um, how we have full editorial control over those and we have an editorial team working on that um, alongside our other journalists within The Guardian. Um, there is one assignment a month where E will have an idea or something that they might want to do and they will discuss that with our commercial team and they'll come together with an idea for a, you know, a competition or an or assignment that they're interested in doing. That's run just like any sort of sponsored <coughs> content that goes on to the site. In terms of every single one of the other assignments, they're editorially independent. One more. Silence. Uh, hi, Lewis from uh, MWI. Um, so... Obviously, um, as you know, one of the biggest um, you know websites in the world for content for journalists and for consumers, um, you probably face increasing questions to monitor tweets and what people can and can't say, you know, more carefully. So I'm just wondering what you say to those people, obviously for Bruce, and um, you know, what do you what do you feel about you know, obviously over the last few years we've seen core cases after tweets and, you know, prison sentences spoken about, you know, do you think law should be involved in tweets as well? And, you know, what's your position on that? It's, it's clearly the, the contemporary question, isn't it, of, of how information, when, when everyone can produce content, how you regulate that. I think our philosophy is very much, with 400 million tweets every day, uh, that the vast volume of content being produced is something that no one could ever regulate. So I think our philosophy is very much that, firstly, what's illegal in the real world is illegal on a platform like Twitter or Facebook or Tumblr. The, the, the same laws still apply. So if someone says something which is uh, illegal, then, then it's still illegal on social media. I think broadly our philosophy is that it's not our job, and nor is it really anyone's job, to edit the internet and, and to, to edit the comments that people might make. Our chief exec talks about Twitter being the free speech wing of the free speech party. Um, but I, I think we, we've got a, a firm sense that clearly there's a lot of things that, whether in, in uh, unstable democracies or in, in different places, that people would rather you didn't hear. But actually it's the, the free flow of information, the ability for people to share that, that probably is more empowering in, in the end. So, so we don't believe we, we should, or anyone should, should edit those things. Thank you.